A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. All the powers of old Europe have entered into a holy alliance to exercise this specter. Hierophant and Lich, Metternich and Guizot, French worker characters and German police spies. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, player and dungeon master, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on in an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have fighting men, paladins, magic users, rogues. In the advanced age, fighters, rangers, monks, druids, illusionists, bards. In almost all of these classes again, subordinate gradations. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, 1218 DR. Hail and well met, adventurers, and welcome to Marxist Theories and Lore. Today we are discussing the Black Box of Communism, the first version of Shop Floors and Supervisors released in 1218 DR by the Communist League, on the eve of the aborted revolutions of 1218. Without this incredible package created by the master himself, Karl Marx, and playtested and edited with the help of Frederick Engels, every aspect of tabletop leftism would be different. Without Shop Floors and Supervisors, would there be GURPS? Powered by the Apocalypse? Robert's Rules? What would anarchism look like? To do this, we're going to have to explore the beginnings of leftist history and how it influenced the first major release of what we now think of as socialism. By the late 12th century, the process of bourgeois revolutions had already begun in Europe and America, giving rise to a rapidly developing industrial working class. The first gasps of the game system we would come to think of as socialism began during the French Revolution, where, at the National Convention, the radicals favored the left side of the room. The origin of the left-wing, right-wing divide that continues to this day. Eventually, the left-wing were defeated and cast down by right-wing forces. France spent the next century going through a succession of bourgeois republics and monarchs with imperial ambitions. There were a few notable left-wing uprisings, but they were never successful for very long. In the wake of the French Revolution, Henri de Saint-Simon analyzed the successes and failures of this world-historic event. He believed that the French Revolution really boiled down to the conflict between workers and idlers, which was an embryonic expression of the later Marxist conception of the historic conflict between the working class, that is to say, people who make their living by selling labor to the bourgeois class, who are the people who own the infrastructure necessary to operate society, who make their living by arbitrage between the value created by the workers and the value itself. This is the embryo of class analysis. Charles Fourier continued the progress toward the socialist game system by analyzing the conditions of life in France after the revolution. The critical mechanic he added to the system was a theory of history. In his understanding, history progresses from savagery to barbarism to patriarchy to full civil society, and it progresses by the contradictions that each level produce and how they are resolved. This is the embryo of historical materialism. England experienced a different manner of revolution that progressed it from a feudal society to an industrialized bourgeois society. Robert Owen was an industrialist who dedicated his life to creating the model of a new society. His communes attempted to display a better way of life, but it is difficult indeed to craft a new society directly on top of an existing one. Even if you devised a perfect system, the existing society would resist, and his attempts were far from perfect. But Owen wasn't simply theorizing about how to create a better game system. He was actively playtesting it. All of these approaches to mechanics were incomplete, and a full game system couldn't develop out of their foundations. It needed one more element of analysis to create a system that could change tabletop gaming forever. The final precursor necessary to the creation of shop floors and supervisors was the rediscovery of dialectics. Dialectics as a concept is very old indeed, first attributed to the Greek philosophers. However, they were held back by the understanding of gameplay they had in this primitive period. Much of philosophy across history has held an idealist conception of reality, 
where discrete objects are an expression of a metaphorical idea that exists in a higher realm of reality. The innovation is instead viewing these supposedly discrete objects as part of a process, a system in tension that is always changing based on the conflicts within it. And this is where the OG Karl Marx enters the story. He was working as a journalist in the 1210s, writing pieces of gameplay analysis and lore on the side. And this is how we met Frederick Engels, who would go on to be a great friend, collaborator, playtester, and patron. Their shared interest in egalitarian gaming, politics, economics, and philosophy allowed them to work together and develop their ideas. Together as a unit, they were able to reconcile all the different mechanics of embryonic tabletop leftism and develop them into a coherent gameplay system. By analyzing historical events as a process, a process through which different classes of people with different economic interests struggle for supremacy, you can create a better gameplay system and maybe, just maybe, actually change the world. And that's the beginning of what would eventually become shop floors and supervisors. As the 1210s wore on, the revolutionary tension all across Europe grew stronger and stronger. Gaming societies proliferated in industrial societies, the League of the Just and the Communist Correspondence Committee. Marx was himself banned from France and in Belgium with the understanding that he would not write any further gameplay articles. As the revolutionary tension grew to a fever pitch, a convention was called. These groups merged together and became the Communist League. And Marx and Engels were tapped to write their first grand game system. And that is how the black box of communism came to be. This version laid out the first incarnation of shop floors and supervisors, although it was merely three short pamphlets that laid out the absolute basics necessary to run your own proletarian revolution. The three pamphlets were Men in Materialism, which provided instructions for crafting worker characters and how to form them into a communist party. Bourgeoisie and Value, which provided details on what kind of terrible monsters you could encounter during a revolution. And the third volume was Factories and Wilderness Adventures, which provided rules for dungeon masters to craft dangerous shop floors for their worker characters to battle through. It was released 21 Alturiac 1218DR, just before the Great Revolutionary Wave spread across all Europe, which then crashed and retreated. Soon afterwards, the Great Revolutionary Gaming Groups were snuffed out and suppressed. Shop floors and supervisors remained underground for a while longer, gestating until advanced shop floors and supervisors could be released, and later still, ASNS Second International. If you want more information about the origins of Marxism and shop floors and supervisors, many of the original spell tomes have fallen out of copyright and are available online for free. The Black Box of Communism is available online as the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels. And Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Engels was of particular help in researching this episode. Thank you for staying all the way to the end. The Devil Inside YouTube wants me to tell you to like, subscribe, friend me on LikeFace, download me on Truth.Social, uh, whatever the hell. But I'm not your boss. If you really want to help, well, join some kind of organization that's doing good. Salt a union. Do strike support. Work security for Drag Queen Story Hour. If you give to my Patreon, I'll send you to for you and spend more time doing the stuff I already do, but only do that if you have too much money and not enough time.